Right. Good morning, guys. It's so good to see you. It's so awesome to get to be here in the room with you all. How you doing? Good, good. I'm doing good, too. Yes. Well, um, it's been a, it's already been like a wonderful time of year for Forever Kids. If you have a kid in Forever Kids, you, you probably know how much fun we have back there. If you don't have a kid in Forever Kids, we just got off of an amazing weekend last weekend. We had our Forever Kids Christmas event, which is like our one big outreach event of the year where we try to invite the whole town to come out to love joy. Here's some pictures. You can see what it was like. Um, it was called a Toy Story. Well, actually, a true story Christmas where we taught people the true story of Christmas. And uh, it was a blast. We had over 400 people come. And the majority of those people don't even go here, which is like totally our mission. It was like we finally got to really reach people who aren't just from, not that we don't love our own people. I mean, we do. But uh, it's just, that's what Christmas is all about, right? Sharing the story of Christmas, the story of Jesus with the whole town. And so um, it was really cool. We had over 30 characters that were in the show. Um, over like a dozen people involved in our set design, painting and building these giant toy props and stuff. We had like an amazing seamstress, Sheila. I don't know if you're here today, Sheila. If you are, wave your hand. Sheila helped create our costume so that every child would look like a giant life-size toy. Well, every character, I mean. <laughs> um, and uh, just tons of volunteers, just really like helping make it look amazing back there. If you are a part of the project of A Toy Story Christmas, can you just stand for a minute so that we can celebrate you and thank you? I mean, we had traffic team members and chaperones, greeters, uh, painters, tech team people, like on and on and on. They were just on mission for a good two months preparing for this moment. So thank you all who are who were a part of that. It was just really special to see those little kids uh, invite Jesus into their hearts. Wow, what an awesome time. And I encourage you guys, we got, we're not done. Our mission isn't over here at Lovejoy. Christmas Eve is in what, two weeks now? Oh my goodness. And so our mission never stops. Our next mission is to really invite people to come to God's house at Christmas time to hear his message of truth and hope and love. You know, our community needs that more than ever. And um, so I encourage you. In fact, my friend Tom Billings, can you wave Tom for our, where are you? There you are, Tom. Okay, for our Toy Story Christmas event, Tom went and hung posters in like every possible business he could think of, just sharing the news about love joy and what God's doing here. And he would talk to people about it. He was giving out personal invitations. He was like Paul, missionary Paul, just going out into these uh, places in the public square, getting the word out. And I think it'd be amazing if all of us just did something like that. And maybe you might not be that kind of person that's just going to go up to somebody, maybe even a text, send a text message out and send it to those relatives that, you know, need Jesus or even your enemies, who, whatever, whatever the case, God is for everyone. Amen. And we are all called as Christians. I tell the kids and forever kids this all the time. We're all called to reach people with the love of Jesus. In fact, a lot of the kids back there started passing out invitations on their school buses. Their teachers were passing the flyers out in their public school classrooms. It was cool. They're on mission back there. And I think if a kid can do it, we could do it too, right? Yeah, well, get ready, guys, because Pastor Jonathan asked me to preach today. <laughs> it's going to be a fun one. <laughs> um, so the reason Pastor Jonathan asked me to preach is because him and, his, and Pastor Nikki, they had a baby. I don't know if you heard. Here she is, Abigail Joy Bergio. She was born on Thursday morning. So precious. So beautiful. They're home from the hospital now, healthy, and just so happy and full of the joy that she brought to their family. So what a blessing. We love you, Pastor Jonathan, Nikki, Hannah, JJ, Faith, and Abigail. We love you guys. They're watching online. So here we are, guys. It's me and you. And <laughs> Pastor
Pastor Jonathan just started a brand new series last week called A Light Has Come. A Light Has Come. And today, my message for you is called A Child Has Come. And that child is Abigail Joy Bergio. <laughs> well, yes, she is the child that came this week. But the child that we're talking about is? Yeah, Jesus. Jesus, not to spoil the the end of the story, but he is the child that has come. If you have your Bible with you today, uh, could you open up to the book of Isaiah? If you don't have your Bible, maybe you use the Bible app or something like that, but one of the things I tell the kids all the time is bring your Bible to church. I know, it feels like a big old textbook, right? (laughs) There's no room for it in your purse. Maybe get a bigger purse, people. We need to bring the Bible with us everywhere we go. Put it in your backpack. Take it to school. Bring it with you when you go to a restaurant. Take it on a long road trip. Bring this book with you. The Bible is our light. It's our lamp. It's our guide. It's our mirror to tell us when we're not looking too good. It's all that we need to thrive in this life. And I think sometimes we take for granted the Word of God. And so today we're going to open to Isaiah. Isaiah is in the Old Testament. And if you're going in your Bible, it's kind of like right in the middle. And um, if you don't know how to find it, I tell the kids, look in the table of contents. You can look in the Old Testament section for Isaiah. It'll tell you what page number it is. See the lost art of just holding a real Bible? What if I was telling you a bunch of mumbo jumbo? You were just going to believe me? When you, <laughs> when you look at the Word of God and you're following along, the Lord can speak to you so much deeper and clearer than if you're just like listening. And maybe you're an audible learner, but there's something special about holding the true Word of God, seeing for yourself what it says, writing down on the, in the columns or underlining something that the Lord speaks to you. This is God's voice. It's His voice words over my words, over the world's words. It's the truth that we need so desperately in a world filled with so many, I don't know, untruths or half-truths or I don't know what's real and right and up and down anymore. But when you have the word of God in your lamp, in your lap, in your life, and um, in your hands, you can become filled with the discernment from the Holy Spirit to know the right way to go. And you can grow. Isn't that awesome? So we're going to do some growing today. (laughs) Now, we're we're in Isaiah chapter 7. And let me give you a quick backstory about Isaiah for a second. Because not all of us might know. And with the kids, I'm always trying to help them get an idea. I mean, there's 66 books in the Bible. It's like a lot of information. Like I said, it kind of can feel like a textbook sometimes. But Isaiah was a prophet. A prophet is like God's messenger. And a prophet was somebody that could predict the future because they were so in tune with God and his voice. They had this supernatural gift to know what God was going to do in the future. It was amazing. And so when Isaiah was alive, he was a preacher, he was a prophet, and he would record the things that God would reveal to him. And during this time, there was a lot of war going on. And people were in the middle of all kinds of sin. And see, God had made the universe and he gave his love out to everybody, but like still people were just trying to like live life their own way. You know what I mean? Have you ever tried to live life your own way? I mean, it's kind of easy. Just do what you want to (laughs) do. But they were never really trying to align themselves with God's ways. And so what happened over time, over the centuries, is that people drifted from God. They weren't walking with him anymore. And there was a lot of chaos, a lot of war, a lot of power-hungry people, a lot of selfish people. Yeah, it was crazy. And so all this stuff's going on, and Isaiah, out of nowhere, has this glimmer of hope for humanity. And it says in Isaiah 7, 14, All right then, the Lord himself will give you the sign. Look, 
The virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Ooh. Can you imagine, like, you hear this prophecy, and it's like almost kind of like, okay, we'll see, you know. <laughs> I mean, all right, he said it. Well, then he goes on into chapter 9, if you flip the page. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. He starts prophesying again about this mysterious child. He says, for to us a child is born. To us a son is given. The government will rest on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Whew, it's starting to get real. This is awesome. What a, what a message of hope in a time that was so dark. What a message of light in the middle of this pure darkness. Now, you see, what Isaiah was doing here, he was being used by God, and as you know, he has the gift of prophecy, and so what he was doing was he was bringing this message to call the people back to God. He was calling them back to God. The whole book of Isaiah addresses this problem of sin. It shows a need for salvation. And Isaiah was used by God to speak to the people of Judah and call attention to their wrongdoings. Now, this isn't always the stuff we like to hear. We, we kind of prefer the lovey-dovey, happy, miracle-working kind of messages, right? But you see, God is so good that he wouldn't let us just get away with anything. He calls it like it is. And when he sees a people doing things that are wrong, that aren't good for them, that hurt other people, and that create generation after generation of sin and darkness, he calls it out and he's ready to put a stop to it. But judgment is not the end of the story here, you guys. Because Isaiah just prophesied salvation and restoration. Let's turn to Luke chapter 2. Luke is in the New Testament. <laughs> We're going to read Luke 2, 1 through 18. Now let me tell you something. Before we jump into Luke, the prophecy that happened from Isaiah happened 700 years before this moment. Let's go into this moment. At that time, the Roman Emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. This was the first census taken when Quirinius was governor of Syria. All returned to their own ancestral towns to register for the census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. He took with him Mary, to whom he was engaged, who is now expecting a child. The child. And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him in snuggly strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. That night, there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified. But the angel reassured them, do not be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will be great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord has been born today in the city of David. 
and you will recognize him by this sign. You will find the baby wrapped in snuggly strips of cloth, lying in a manger. Suddenly, the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, Let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. They hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph, and there was the baby lying in the manger. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. Wow. All who heard the shepherds' story were astonished, but Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen. It was just as the angel had told them. Wow. A true story, a historical account of this coming child that came and entered the human race to be with you and me. Emmanuel, God with us. He's finally here. It's interesting studying this passage. You know, we hear the Christmas story like over and over and over every single Christmas. So if you're like 60 years old, you've probably heard it like 50 times, maybe 60. I don't know. It's, it's nuts. And so sometimes it can get old and feel like mundane and like, yeah, 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 I know it. Well, I thought it would be cool to just kind of study it a little deeper and take us on a journey to find out some things that like took place historically and, and what the culture was like here. And so if you're into that sort of thing, you like to take notes, go ahead. Maybe you're like me and you like to literally like scribble in your Bible. Great way to do it if you have your own Bible. But in verse 6, it says that Mary wrapped Jesus in clothes herself. And what's interesting is that there weren't really any family or friends present here, right? There were no doctors and nurses. It was actually a lonely birth. Oh, other than the nearby animals. I'm sure they got real close, right? <laughs> Maybe a little too close. But Jesus laid in the manger. He was born in a stable, a barn. He was very poor. He came from a poor family. And he was there under the same roof as these animals, which basically points to um, the poverty that this family had been under and the obscurity and the rejection. I mean, they, there was no room for them. I love that song we were singing earlier. I will make room for you. They didn't make room for Jesus here. Well, it's so interesting that the first um, people flash forward to this, this part about the shepherds. It's really interesting that the first people um, that God chose to make the formal, official birth announcement to were the shepherds. Shepherds in this time had a really bad reputation. They were like, mm-mm. One of the primary reasons that they had such a bad reputation was because of the nature of their calling to be shepherds kept them from being able to observe the religious like traditions and ceremonies and stuff. So basically what that means is like they were kind of working so much that they never really went to church. They weren't really doing all of the ceremonial religious-y type things. So people in society just viewed them as, oh, they didn't go to church this week. Tsk, tsk, tsk. These shepherds had a bad reputation. And more regrettable was their un unfortunate habit. Of con of, okay, let me try this again. Even more regrettable was their un unfortunate habit of confusing the words mine and thine. Okay, think for a second what that might mean. I don't know if that means that they were like thieves, <laughs> like, oh, that's mine, not yours, or I'll take that, or, or maybe they were just bad at words, 
and they were really dumb. In fact, a lot of scholars say that the shepherds were kind of more on the lower totem pole as far as like knowing stuff. I don't know how else to say it. <laughs> shepherds came from a despised class. Now, there's not necessarily a reason to believe that this specific group of shepherds were, like, necessarily not devout men. I mean, they might have been great guys. But overall, the general, uh, the general vibe of a shepherd or group of shepherds, they just had a bad reputation. What that tells me and tells us is that it didn't matter to Jesus. He came for them. And he chose to make his first birth debut announcement to these bad reputationed shepherds. And, like, they are the ones that got the news. Look at that angel. Oh, could you imagine bursting out of the sky a bright light? Uh, you, you, didn't even, you didn't even know, like, is that a human? Is that an alien? Is that a... Squeeze toy alien? <laughs> Is that a bird? I don't know. No, it was an angel. <laughs> wow. And so these shepherds, despite the fact of their track record and what he said and she said about them, God chose to make his official birth announcement to them, this lowly, poor, unreliable, unprofessional, unhygienic, uncivilized group of people. And not only was it a mere birth announcement or some kind of breaking news update, it was a personal invitation to come right on over to the hospital room and get on in there with the blood and the guts and all that happened and see up close and personal the very presence of Jesus. And the angel told them the exact time and location. And it reminds me of this. Uh, I have an invitation I got to put up on the screen here. Um, have you ever gotten an invitation in the mail to a party or something? Or maybe you got a birth announcement and you, they, they wanted you to see the baby. Well, the shepherds got this. You're invited. What? A Savior has been born. When? Today. Where? The town of David. Who? Well, for you, the address. Well, he's lying in a manger. So just like wherever you see a baby lying in a manger, head that way. That's probably where he is. Well, they were very, they gave the news. They wanted them to go right away. And so what happened was they did. They went. The, the Bible says that they hurried over there, despite the fact that they were terrorized a few moments before that. Because truly, when they saw these angels in the sky, you could put the angels back up. Those angels freaked them out. But the first word that the angel said to them was a word of comfort by telling them, don't be afraid. This is actually good news. This isn't something bad. We know that the population and even you shepherds have done some bad things. We know that there's a lot of judgment from God coming. But God actually has good news of great joy that will be for all people people. This good news was later translated to the term gospel. The gospel, the deliverance of God's people. The angel describes baby Jesus as Christ the Lord, which describes him in the highest terms possible, meaning that it was a pretty big deal. When the message ended, all of a sudden, a multitude of other angels showed up praising God. It was, an, it was a host. It was an entire angel army, an army of angels. But they didn't show up to go to war. They showed up to bring peace and wholeness and redemption for you and for me and especially for those bad shepherds. <laughs> When the angels said, glory to God, it was a form of praise and worship that ushered in real peace on earth. Peace between God and people. You see, a lot of times we think peace is only like a, from like 
peace between conflict that people are in a fight or they don't get along too good or peace between like this country and that country. But no, even beyond that, God's priority in this moment was peace between him and us. The healing of the division and separation that was caused by human evil. We hate to admit it, but we are all kind of evil at times. And this fulfillment of prophecy that came from Isaiah 9, 6, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government, even the government, will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Verse 15, the shepherds hurried to see for themselves with so much urgency that they just couldn't wait. They abandoned those sheep. They probably all got eaten by wolves that night or something. Who knows? But at least their career ended and they got to go do something else for a change. I don't know. But they literally dropped everything. It reminds me of when the fishermen, the disciples, were out um, before they became disciples, and they were out on the water, and Jesus said, get out of the boat, come follow me. And they dropped their nets, they left those fish and all that money they were making, and they followed Jesus. Nothing else matters when Jesus shows up. Luke records the wonder with which everybody received the news as the reason for their coming. And there he was, live in person, the coming child, the Messiah, the one that Isaiah had prophesied about over 700 years ago. And then Luke, he rounds off this historic account in the Bible with the return of the shepherds. And the shepherds just like left the manger, left the stable, and they were on a mission. They were pumped. They saw the craziest stuff that night, and they realized it wasn't a dream. It was all real. They experienced the presence of God for themselves in the form of a tiny baby. It made no sense, but it didn't matter. They went out praising, worshiping. They left that bad reputation that they had, and they worshiped Jesus and told the world everything that had happened. He was finally made available to us. You see, this coming child, Jesus, represents God's presence, his very presence. It was made tangible in the most real, raw, humble, human way. It was a gift to a world that was a mess, a complete mess. And the presence of God right there was a gift to us in our complete mess, whether we'd like to admit it or not. This coming child made God's presence personal. You see, he became present. He was no longer this God who operated from a distance where, like, he had to be like Moses. And in order to see God face to face, well, kind of face, I think you'd get struck dead, right? Well, anyways, you had to go up to this mountain. But before you even went to the mountain, you had to, like, do all these ceremonial things to, like, cleanse yourself and be forgiven. You go up to the mountain. You get up to the mountain. But before you get up there, you got to take your shoes and sandals off. And, and you finally get up there. But I think you couldn't even look at God. It was like this big deal. And only Moses could meet with God face to face. It was complicated. But God finally in this moment made himself so personal, so accessible through Jesus. It was a whole new way because he noticed that the people needed more of him. It was Emmanuel. He was finally Emmanuel, God with us. He was a present that was made present to give us his presence. Let me say that again. Jesus was a present, like a gift. Jesus was a present that was made present here in, in front of us to give us his presence. He was a present that was made present to give us his presence. His presence. There's nothing better than his presence. 
His presence is that hope that fills your heart when you're weak and you've got nothing left. His presence is that hug and that warmth that you feel when you know that God is real in that very moment. His presence becomes tangible, physical, spiritual, and supernatural. His presence came to be with us for us. Maybe you're here today and you've never even experienced God's presence or you don't know what that's even like. Wow, it's such a gift. Wow, because that baby was not just a baby that was in this manger of a little statue that you put under your Christmas tree at Christmas time. No, he was a real person that went through the things we go through. He was a human that understood what pain and suffering was like. He saw people at their worst and he brought them hope and healing and miracles. He was the hope that we needed. He was present. He went through it with us. And even after he died on the cross and came back to life and went up to heaven, he still left us the gift of his presence. You see, he never really left. He's here with us. And there's some of you here today, you have no idea what God's presence looks like in your life. You don't know what I'm talking about. Or maybe some of you today, you kind of are starting to feel it. Maybe some of you felt it your whole life. It's not some weird, wacky thing where, oh no, people are going to get crazy here now. No, God's classy. He is. But he's also fun. Jesus has been here lingering and waiting to pour out his presence over your life every time you come to church. Maybe you felt it. Maybe you haven't. Maybe you've already, maybe you feel him beating on the heartstrings of your heart. Maybe you've been pushing him away. Maybe your heart's closed off. You probably have a lot of good reasons why, too. When I was eight years old, I experienced God's presence for the first time in my life, and it was so cool. I was invited to go to a church camp, and they had a preacher, just kind of like I'm preaching here today. It was for kids, and the preacher was talking. I hardly remember. I just remember she had a white flag, and she said that God's love is the flag that flies high over the castle of your heart, meaning like his love is just right over your life. And I just remember... All of a sudden, she said, well, if any of you guys want to come up here to pray, just come up. And the whole time she was talking, I was like a kid, so I couldn't even explain. I wanted to cry, but, like, I wasn't sad. I was actually super happy, but, like, the tears just start coming, right? It was so cool. And uh, I remember just feeling super excited. And the moment she said, well, if you want to come up here to be closer to God, come on up, I went there. And it was like the moment my knees hit the ground, I felt God's love surround me like a real blanket. Like he was so real, so awesome, and his love was so sweet. I was sobbing, a total sobbing mess. Kids all over the place were crying their eyes out. It was amazing. And I just remember never wanting to leave. And, you know, it was a camp, so you eventually had to go back to your cabin. And I just didn't want to go. They had to, like, pry me out of there because it was so sweet. And that moment marked me because it filled me up with the joy, the peace, the hope, the truth that I needed. It was a confirmation in my spirit that all these times I've heard preaching about Jesus and read the stories, it was all true because in that moment I felt him. And that's what happens when Jesus comes. He came here so you could have him, so you could hold him, so he could hold you, so you could feel him. There was a time what happened, I mean, it happened so many times in my life, it's like, like it might have for you too. Actually, I'll tell you some stories in Forever Kids because we help those kids go deep. (laughs) Okay, so in Forever Kids, we have the worship nights that happen um, a couple times a year on a Friday night. And so it was funny because sometimes not a lot of kids come to these worship nights. Um, We had like, I don't know, 15 kids there the one night. We had our worship band playing and leading the kids in worship. And I (laughs) don't know. At the end of it, and I mean, I, I felt God. Like, God was there. He was so sweet and 
brought me to tears and just like the good kind, you know? Well, I look over and it's time to go. And this little boy, six years old, named Parker, he comes to the door for his parents to pick him up. And he was crying. And I'm like, oh, great. Somebody probably punched him or like, this is going to look great. <laughs> and his mom was like, Parker, honey, what's the matter? Are you okay? And, and he couldn't even put into words. So she, she just took him out of the room and, and got alone with him. And she said, honey, what happened? And he, and he said, I just felt God, God's, God's making me cry happy tears. It was like the cutest way that he described it, right? And it was just so special. And I thought, oh, I don't know. I, look at me. I'm like so skeptical. Like, did that really happen? Like, did a kid really feel God? I mean, it was nobody came this week. Come on. So uh, we have a YouTube live stream. So I quick went on YouTube and I, I looked at the live stream footage to see if I could notice him in the audience. And you see in the shadows this little six year old boy and he's just kneeling down. And, and he's going like this, and, and every couple minutes you see him go. Ah, it was like the most beautiful, pure thing that wasn't forced. It just happened. And God just wants us to come to him with the faith of a little kid, the faith of a child. Just like he came as a child, it's like so beautiful when we come with that purity. And today, um, I'm going to invite the band to come up as we kind of get ready to close. It's not quite over. Hang on. <laughs> um, just there's so much more of God that we can experience if we just open our hearts and say yes to him. He's the best. He's so faithful. There's more and more and more. I have a present that I got you guys. Let me go get it. Can you believe it? <laughs> Merry Christmas. <laughs> yeah. Look at this baby. What do you think? A bike or or a uh, Unlimited pizza? I don't know. Let's open it up and see, okay? Oh, my goodness. This is special. Not everybody gets a present from their kid's pastor. <laughs> okay, I, I'm going to be honest. It's not from me. It's from Jesus. Isaiah 9-6. Actually, Isaiah 7-14. We got the gift of Emmanuel. Yeah! God with us! present right here in the flesh available to us not on a distance not a far away right here with us Isaiah 9 6 a wonderful counselor he became our counselor how many counseling sessions do you pay for <laughs> and I know they're helpful but there's nothing better than the, your maker helping guide you. So. Mighty God. I know, it seems kind of like it's all about him, right? <laughs> it's strong God. The strength of your life. Okay? How many times do you feel weak and hopeless? Oh boy, this is a heavy one. Everlasting Father. A forever Father. You're in a, a family now. When you've got Jesus, you're in His family. You're His. You belong to Him. He'll protect you. The Prince of Peace. Another translation says the Prince of Wholeness. For any of you with the broken heart. Healer. He'll be your healer. He wants to heal you. so bad and we just feel like we're doing it on our own. We weren't ever meant to do it on our own. 
provider. Oh, he's got it all. Comforter. I can remember times where I just wished that someone could give me a hug. <laughs> like, your friends sometimes aren't enough, you know? they'll never understand what you mean or what you're going through. God does. Jesus, our Redeemer, the gift of redemption, no matter how many times you mess it up, no matter how many times you go back to your sin, he'll redeem it over and over and over. Friend, Jesus, a gift that keeps giving and giving and giving. This is a bottomless pit. He's got so much. There's so much more. And when we come hungry for him and we let go of the things that we keep holding on to and we just say, yes, I want to experience your presence. I want to know you in a deeper way. Show me that you're real. I'm sick of hearing it from other people. I want to know for myself. These are the honest prayers that he wants us to pray because his presence is everything. It sustains us. It keeps us going. It directs us and redirects us. It shows us and confirms to us exactly who we are, exactly what our purpose is, and the real reason for life is Him. It's Jesus. But let me tell you something. This gift, it's a present that is offered to you over and over and over again. But there's going to come a time where it will be too late for you to receive this gift. God wants you to freely take his love and his presence. But if you don't want it, he won't force it. He'll just let it go. pray for you guys this morning and as we close I just want to challenge you um, go ahead and open your hands up in your lap uh, maybe we can turn the lights down a little bit we do this in forever kids because we get distracted but this is a moment for God to shine can it get any darker that'd be really awesome sometimes when you want to feel God's presence and you just don't know how and you don't know what to do, a good thing to do is to get alone or get away or, or shut off the distractions or let go of the things that you're holding on to, whether it's your problem of the week or the phone in your hand or the girlfriend or even husband, whatever. Sometimes we become each other's crutch. But God wants us all of you, the whole, your whole self. So God, this morning, there are hungry hearts in this room, hearts that have heard your story over and over and over again, hearts that are hungry to feel you, to know you, to have you, to hold you. And God, I just pray for a, a pouring out, an outpouring of your presence over these people today from the youngest to the oldest, for those who've been walking with you every single day of their life and those who've hardly begun the journey. God, I pray that you would move mightily inside of them. Show them how real and amazing and awesome you are and speak to them in a personal way, just like the personal God that you are. We thank you for your presence and we thank you for your love. In Jesus' name, everybody said,